Good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome at the press conference following uh, today's meeting of the Foreign Affairs uh, Council. Apologies uh, uh, for, for, for this slight uh, delay. Uh, High Representative Vice President Federica Mogherini will present briefly the outcomes of today's discussions and then uh, we'll take a few of your questions. High Rep, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, you have already seen uh, the outcome of this uh, Foreign Affairs Council. Uh, so I will uh, um, uh, follow the example of the last councils and uh, be very uh, short in my introduction and let uh, uh, you have more time for the questions. Um, to tell you the truth, uh, when I was coming in this morning, I was not expecting uh, necessarily to have conclusions on the two points we had on the agenda uh, today. The first two points, uh, uh, namely uh, Syria and uh, the Turkish drilling activities in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, this could have been possible, but this could have also been uh, uh, useful if it was just a preparation for the European Council that takes place uh, later this week. Um, after long uh, uh, discussions and work with the ministers, and I want to thank them all because they uh, showed uh, a lot of uh, um, commitment to finding uh, a common European Union approach to both issues uh, that are separate but somehow uh, connected uh, um, in, uh, in some respect. Um, we've managed to find a consensus, so we have a common uh, united uh, European Union position, first of all on uh, the developments uh, in the northeast uh, of Syria. I uh, imagine you have seen uh, the Council conclusions already, uh, so you have seen that uh, there is a clear condemnation from the European Union side of Turkey's military action uh, in the northeast uh, of uh, uh, Syria. There is a strong support for the UN-mediated political process and I'm grateful to the UN Special Envoy Pedersen that has joined us uh, this morning, uh, briefing us on uh, um, the state of play and also the perspectives and also the difficulties of the political process uh, under his auspices uh, to be restarted in Geneva. I want to say very clearly there is a strong support from our side in the first place to the uh, beginning of the work of the Constitutional Committee. We believe that it has been extremely important, uh, the fact that he has managed to uh, find an agreement uh, for the first time ever on the constitution of uh, this constitutional committee. So we definitely want to see this uh, starting to work uh, in Geneva and we're ready to support it. Um, there is also uh, a common clear uh, position of the European Union and the Member States uh, on uh, um, our uh, support and our common uh, uh, commitment to the global coalition against Daesh. You might have seen in the conclusions we call for a ministerial meeting uh, of the global coalition because we see as one of the most immediate consequences of this uh, military activities uh, in the northeast of Syria the fact that uh, Daesh could uh, refine uh, its breathing space. Uh, inside that territory. That worries us enormously. This is uh, a direct security threat to the European Union, uh, uh, not only to the European Union, first and foremost to the region and the international community. So we want to see uh, this tackled uh, in the global coalition uh, format. Um, and um, there is uh, obviously also our uh, strong uh, commitment, as usual, to the stability of the region. Um, and let me say that, in particular, any uh, attempt to have uh, uh, any kind of uh, demographic engineering uh, in that region uh, would be seen from our side as uh, particularly dangerous. Um, there is also a commitment that Member States have uh, taken uh, to have uh, uh, clear and strong national positions regarding their arms export policy to Turkey. We have a common position uh, on arms export control. Uh, and they all committed uh, to um, apply that framework uh, uh, to their um, exports uh, of uh, arms uh, to Turkey. And obviously, uh, we reaffirmed the uh, commitment we have uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, addressing uh, the serious humanitarian crisis and refugee crisis in uh, light of the evolving needs. And uh, I was able to debrief the ministers of also the uh, call that I had with Under Secretary General Lokok uh, that uh, was in Gazette uh, uh, in the uh, recent days. Um, and our uh, strong uh, determination to support, in particular, 
the countries in the region that are facing uh, um, uh, important uh, uh, consequences in terms of humanitarian and refugee crisis. Um, when it comes to the Council conclusions on um, the illegal drilling activities in the Eastern Mediterranean, there is a, um, a clear recalling uh, of uh, the conclusions we adopted already in July, and in particular the um, need to address the delimitation of the exclusive economic zone uh, and continental shelf through dialogue and negotiations in good faith, in full respect of international law and in accordance with the principle of good neighbourly relations. And there is uh, um, the agreement uh, between, among all member states um, to put in place a framework regime of restrictive measures targeting natural and legal persons responsible for or involved in the illegal drilling activities uh, in the East Mediterranean. Um, so uh, I will present together with the Commission um, the legal proposals uh, uh, to this effect uh, in the coming days. Um, let me add that we had uh, um, another important point on the agenda today. We welcomed uh, uh, the new uh, Foreign Minister of Ukraine. Uh, we received from him uh, a very uh, comprehensive uh, and, I would say, um, satisfactory picture of the plans that the government and the administration have on uh, the reform uh, agenda of the country, but also on how to address the conflict in the east of Ukraine. Um, we've seen some positive developments. We're very much willing to support them, uh, and uh, um, we uh, reconfirmed um, to him, and obviously through him to all the Ukrainian people, the European Union's strong determination to um, uh, support uh, Ukraine, uh, its sovereignty, its territorial integrity, our non-recognition policy uh, of the illegal annexation of Crimea and Sebastopol, and uh, even um, or as important than that, uh, our determination to continue to fully support uh, Ukraine's reform agenda. Uh, as you know, the European Union has put in place the highest amount of EU assistance to any third country for Ukraine. We're talking about 15 billion euros uh, over the last uh, uh, years. Um, and uh, we have a, a very ambitious association agreement in place, a visa-free regime in place. We are determined to continue to support uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian people in, this, uh, in these times. Um, I will stop here. And yes, uh, due to the fact that the discussion on, on, uh, on the northeast of Syria and of the drillings uh, took longer than uh, expected, Actually, it was quite expected, I would say. Uh, we um, uh, will postpone the point uh, that was foreseen on Afghanistan to the next Foreign Affairs Council in November. Thank you very much. Now it's time for your questions. Please, as usual, introduce yourself and the media you're working for. <laughs> and I'll start with Efi at the back. Uh, hi, this is uh, Efi Kutsakosta from Euronews. I have actually two questions. One is uh, regarding the illegal drillings of Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean. If you have any concrete time frame, when are you going to propose these uh, restrictive measures to the Council? And should we expect something during the meeting of the leaders this week? And the second question is, because you said that uh, the EU was fully united regarding these uh, two uh, decisions, what do you have to say for the fact that the Hungarian foreign minister decided to go to a meeting in Baku with, along with Turkey to discuss even about business? Doesn't this undermine the message of unity that you want to send? Thank you. Every member state uh, is responsible for the consistency of its policy uh, positions. Uh, here we had, we had a unanimous decision taken. Uh, no member state opposed uh, to that. On the contrary, each and every member state, each of the 28, contributed actively to the wording of the conclusions, both of them, uh, none excluded. Uh, and there is, uh, as I said, unanimity, full consensus on these two uh, sets of uh, conclusions. Then it's up uh, to single ministers or member states uh, to guarantee their internal cohesion and consistency of their policies. Uh, when it comes to the time framework, uh, I cannot uh, um, give you details about uh, the timing, uh, also because it depends on uh, the technical preparation that it will be now required uh, for our um, services to put in place the legal um, uh, provisions uh, that will be then uh, proposed to the Council working groups, but the political decision is taken today. And I think this is the main message that comes uh, uh, from the Council on the drillings, uh, and that is that the political 
final decision uh, is taken today, the 28 member states agreed to put in place um, the framework of restrictive uh, um, measures, uh, and uh, uh, now the technical steps will follow. Thanks, thanks a lot, Lawrence Norman, the Wall Street Journal. Since this may or may not be your last uh, you Foreign Affairs <laughs> Council President, I, I, I will ask two questions. Um, both on Turkey. You, you mentioned the EU call for a ministerial meeting of the anti-ISIS coalition. Um, my understanding is the French have been calling for this for days. Why has this not happened? Is it fundamentally because Washington is not keen to press Turkey to end an offensive that it seems to have green-lighted? And second question, when you came into office those very, very, very long five years ago, I remember one of your key goals was to rejuvenate the Turkey relationship. And very early on there was a big EU mission to Turkey about getting the relationship going again, etc., etc. What What went wrong? First of all, uh, you shouldn't ask me, uh, and I answer both questions. Um, remember that for November, and you skipped me one in case I'm still here. Uh, on the global coalition against Daesh, uh, it is not for the European Union or for any of our member states to convene the ministerial meeting. As you know, it's a, a global coalition that is led by the United States. Uh, you should ask them, and not me, uh, why it has not been convened yet. Uh, but uh, it is a general feeling of all the EU member states uh, that uh, that is the appropriate format uh, uh, that needs to, um, to convene uh, to address one specific issue that is extremely serious for all of us in Europe, but also, uh, I believe, internationally, that is how to make sure that the current uh, military activities in the northeast of Syria don't open uh, up uh, the space for Daesh to uh, have a sort of resurrection, because Daesh has never been completely defeated. It has been uh, significantly defeated from a territorial point of view. Uh, but we've always uh, warned uh, and warned ourselves, first of all, but also others in the global coalition against Daesh, that this defeat uh, uh, was uh, uh, still to be considered something to be consolidated, not only on the ground, but also uh, on the political environment that could uh, have been again conducive to Daesh to uh, regather forces. And uh, we have a very serious concern about the fact that this military activity that Turkey is undertaking in the northeast of Syria is reopening the way for Daesh to uh, rebuild its uh, territorial gains and also to recruit uh, not only the foreign fighters but also the local forces that uh, um, it used to have in the northeast of, uh, of Syria. So there is a serious concern. Uh, there is a security uh, priority for Europeans. And as the uh, global coalition against Daesh has been effective, in these last years under U.S. leadership uh, to achieve a lot in terms of defeating Daesh. And this is relevant not only for Europeans, it's relevant for Syrians, obviously. It's relevant for Iraqis. I spoke to the uh, Iraqi president just a few days ago, and we uh, agreed on how relevant and important it is to, um, to, to consolidate uh, the gains we had uh, in the fight against Daesh and to focus, I said it already, uh, in the debate in the European Parliament last Wednesday, and to focus on our common fight against the UN-listed uh, terrorist uh, organizations. This is something that unites us, has always united so far, and I believe, we believe, that it is uh, important to have that discussion uh, in the anti-Daesh coalition. No, not we are doing that today in a very formal way. Uh, we will see what the answer will be. Um, and then uh, Turkey. Listen, we have here today uh, two conclusions, uh, two formal positions of the European Union that are important ones. Uh, one on the drilling activities of Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean, and one on the Turkish military activities in the northeast uh, of Syria. These are uh, heavy conclusions, um, and uh, I believe that uh, it will not go unnoticed, uh, not only in Ankara, but also elsewhere. Having said that, um, and I tell you this uh, not only on a personal note, but also reflecting, and I'm sure about this, uh, um, reflecting the general feeling of, uh, uh, of uh, the EU member states, um, uh, the situation in Syria and the situation in, uh, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, doesn't uh, cover all
all the fields uh, on which our relationship with Turkey is important. There are other issues uh, uh, from people-to-people -people contacts uh, uh, to energy uh, or uh, common work that we could do uh, in other uh, areas. Um, We've always tried to build constructive uh, partnerships uh, with Turkey. Sometimes it has worked, sometimes it has not worked. We have lived uh, dramatic moments. Turkey has lived dramatic moments. We should never forget. Uh, in uh, uh, um, in uh, July 2015, a dramatic attempted coup, uh, when we expressed our strongest solidarity to the institutions and the people of Turkey. Um, it is not uh, a kind of relationship that you can uh, define uh, um, as, uh, as a black and white one. Uh, it's a complex, uh, uh, multi-layered, um, dimensional uh, partnership. And I believe that uh, when the European Union and Turkey also uh, manages to be clear, um, extremely clear on what we see um, we agree upon and what we do not agree upon, this helps us also addressing other issues uh, in a more, uh, in a clearer way, in a more direct way. Um, I think we need, as neighbours uh, that share the same geographical space, um, we need to be clear with each other, knowing that uh, we share a lot of common interests, starting from the security of the region, but we also have some disagreements. Again, um, no mystery that uh, Turkey considers as terrorist organizations some organizations that the European Union doesn't consider terrorist organizations. This has always been a point of difference between us. This doesn't mean that we cannot agree on other things, but this doesn't mean that we have to hide the fact that we disagree on something. And I think that today we've done a good exercise of clarity from our side. That might help us also being clear on other issues that might be more positive in the future. Hi, Ruud Mikkers, The Telegraaf, Netherlands. I have a question concerning um, uh, the weapon export to Turkey. It's not an official embargo. Uh, why um, is that uh, so? Um, and now it's um, official a freeze, I think, of the, of the weapons export. And is that explicitly um, for, for every EU member and written by every EU member state? Because the conclusions were a little bit fake about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, they were not vague. Uh, they're very clear, I think. Um, and uh, there is a clear commitment from member states. And when we say member states, we say all member states uh, that commit to strong national positions regarding their arms export policy to Turkey on the basis of the provision of the common position on arms export control. This means that there is, yes, a halt uh, in, uh, uh, in the export uh, policies. The reason why this is not uh, uh, happening through uh, a formal establishment of uh, um, an arms embargo that goes through the uh, procedural working groups and uh, decision making is on one side that this, is, uh, uh, this, this mechanism allows for a more immediate um, uh, uh, decision-making that can be taken at national level and can be supervised and coordinated at European Union level, so it's, it's faster in, uh, in its uh, implementation. But also, uh, if you look at uh, the list of countries uh, on which the European Union has an Europe a formal European Union arms embargo uh, restrictive uh, framework, um, you will not find – well, you would find mainly countries that, um, for which an arms embargo is foreseen by the UN Security Council resolutions, and this is not the case, uh, because normally, well, in most cases, the European Union sanction policy um, implements UN Security Council resolutions, not always, not only, but in most cases, and in particular when it comes to arms embargo, think of Libya, we're implementing uh, a UN Security Council resolution in that case, or you would find uh, a certain number of countries that are uh, definitely uh, into different situations than a NATO ally is. Um, again, uh, this is a question more for NATO than for me, but uh, as we have so many EU member states that are also NATO allies, and as there are some provisions among NATO allies when it comes to the technicalities of exporting arms, we do not want member states that are also NATO allies to be in a complicated legal position uh, when it comes to enforcing a European Union uh, framework of uh, arms embargo that is formally taken. So this formula – sorry, if it's a bit technical, but I guess you get the nuances – this formula allows every country, every EU member state 
to abide by the common position that is a European Union common position on arms embargo, having the same effect of an arms embargo but without putting into question uh, their belonging to the NATO alliance in case they are members of the NATO alliance. Barza Hassan, reporter from Kurisan 24. It is maybe uh, it's, it's a little bit maybe uh, too late to do any action from the European Union because uh, everybody knows uh, yesterday uh, Kurdish uh, authority with the, U, uh, with the Syrian government and Russia, they have deal. So unfortunately, I think it is very uh, too late because uh, during uh, three or five years ago, uh, the Kurdish, they, they have been died uh, more than 10,000 Kurdish fighters during defeated ISIS, but uh, the European Union and the USA uh, they just ignore it. Thank you. I don't see the question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we can move on. Um, your reaction, please. Uh, do you think it's too late uh, to do some, any action from the European Union? Because uh, yesterday, the Kurdish Authority with uh, Russia and Syria, yeah, I know. they have a deal. So what's your reaction? Uh, I, I think it's never too late to do the right thing. Uh, and I can definitely not respond for the U.S. Uh, policy uh, on uh, their uh, allies uh, on the ground uh, in northeast Syria. This is something you should ask uh, those that have been fighting on the ground, uh, starting with uh, uh, the U.S. troops uh, that are now being withdrawn. I think I repeated several times in this room and in Brussels, the European Union as such has never been a military player in Syria for a specific reason. Uh, that we have always believed that uh, uh, there are even too many armies in Syria. Uh, we believe that uh, the way forward uh, is and should be the political process and not uh, the arms and the armies that are uh, fighting in that territory. Um, and I've seen that some have uh, I've mentioned the fact that uh, the European Union is not uh, in these days, able to stop uh, the uh, Turkish uh, military activities in uh, northeast Syria because we don't have an army. Uh, well, uh, our member states do have armies, but they are not uh, in that territory in Syria. This means that uh, the reason why we're not militarily present there is because we have always believed that the way is not fighting on the ground from the European countries, but it is uh, to support the UN mediation process and find a way out uh, to the Syrian conflict through diplomacy and in particular through the full implementation of 2254. Having said that, the war against Daesh has happened on the ground, has happened including with our support, including from the European Union to all the forces that have been fighting Daesh on the ground, including, including the Kurdish forces, consistently and all over these years. This support has never been uh, taken away from the European Union side. Uh, I remember I've personally um, had long hours of discussion with my Turkish counterparts about that. The European Union has always been consistent on this. Having said that, one of the consequences uh, that we have, uh, we have warned before the military intervention uh, in northeast uh, uh, Syria from the Turkish side had started was exactly this, that this would have pushed the Kurdish forces in the hands of the Assad regime and uh, the Russians. And this is something that definitely we didn't want to see uh, because we believe that uh, one thing is the fight against Daesh, the other thing is uh, uh, finding uh, a political solution to the conflict uh, in Syria that will have to include uh, some elements uh, of accountability for the crimes that have been committed by the Syrian regime against its own people. So the level of complexity uh, of the different problems that now we will have to be solved uh, increases. Uh, I believe uh, that this would be the moment for uh, other uh, global powers uh, to um, sit together and uh, see how they can uh, put an end to this. Because I believe that uh, regardless of our differences, we all share one common goal, and that is putting an end finally to the war in Syria. And we know what is the way forward to that. It's written in the UN Security Council Resolution 2254. We started to work on this in uh, some years back. I believe that this would be the right moment to restart working on that. But again, 
it's clear that the situation on the ground and the raising tensions among the regional powers and the global powers is not conducive to that. But this is the European position. We believe that this would be the wise thing to do. Nordin Faridi from the Arab News Channel. But Mogherini, the coming back of the uh, Syrian regime forces to the border between Syria and Turkey, do we see it? A factor of stabilization, a helpful factor in the fight against Daesh? And is there any move after the discussion today that the European Union member states may uh, decide to uh, bring back their uh, foreign fighters uh, nationals? This is not uh, one issue that uh, – this is not an issue we discussed today with the, with the ministers. In fact, you do not see this reflected in the Council conclusions. Uh, this is an issue that we discussed uh, uh, in uh, uh, recent months. Uh, it's not necessarily competence of the foreign ministers. You know that different member states have different uh, uh, legal frameworks for addressing this uh, issue of the foreign fighters. It's mainly a mix of competences between foreign ministers, defense ministers, interior ministers, justice and home affairs, and in some cases even social affairs, because when you have minors, um, this, is, uh, this is an issue also of social protection. Uh, on this, uh, the competence is uh, a member state's competence. I've always offered member states support if they want some coordinating uh, uh, space uh, for addressing this. Uh, but again, this is not something we've discussed today. Um, Paddy Smith, Irish Times. Uh, I want to just ask you about the NATO membership of, of many member states and the extent to which that has inhibited decision-making today, because it, it's clear, for example, that the, the use of the word condemn was problematic probably because of wanting to show deference to a fellow NATO member. It's clear that there are problems with the embargo uh, because of NATO obligations of member states. And, and I understand that one minister raised the possibility of, of having to consider in the future Article 5 commitments by uh, NATO members should, for example, the state of Turkey come under attack from Syria. Is, is this, is this a, uh, it must be the first time the, the membership of, of NATO has actually actually become problematic in a way for EU decision making? I wouldn't say that this has been problematic for the EU decision making, no. Uh, I guess this might be problematic, uh, well, this situation might be problematic for NATO, but it's something you have to, to ask NATO. But it doesn't have a, an impact on the EU decision making. Uh, in fact, we have a common position uh, today. Uh, but I guess that, yes, uh, it might be. Uh, quite complicated for, for NATO to handle a situation like this, but this is not for the European Union. My name is Ala Shali from Rudau Media Network from Kurdistan, Iraq. My question is, uh, Madame Mogherini, do you think that weapons embargo is enough to stop Turkey? What's about economic embargo? Uh, do you think about the next step will be economic sanction? Uh, by Turkey, you know, you have. I think you have seen that uh, military operation by Turkey killed a lot of civil, uh, uh, civilians. And um, the courts say we don't have any uh, option. We have to cooperate with Assad. The situation is very difficult for courts. What can it do? What what need to do now? to stop Turkey, that's important. You know, um, you often uh, uh, say the European Union doesn't speak with one voice. And this time we spoke with one voice, uh, exactly when it was needed, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, even Monday. Uh, I was in Jordan uh, when the news came. So we spoke united with one voice, with very clear messages, and we asked from the very beginning Turkey to uh, first of all, not to start a military action in the northeast of Syria and then to stop it. So in this case, we had one clear, united voice. As many others in the world, maybe not everybody was as clear and as timely as we were, but the common message came uh, in, in a certain coordinated manner. This uh, didn't stop uh, the Turkish military activity. Now we're taking a further step. So uh, 
in one sense, I'm uh, glad that in this, in this occasion, the European Union and the Member States are not only able to speak with one voice, but also to act in unison. And we take a further step. Will that be enough? We'll see. What will be decided if that is not enough is something that we will discuss afterwards. The European Council will have a meeting uh, in, uh, later this week. Uh, I imagine that they will uh, um, uh, endorse our decisions today and obviously uh, see how the situation develops on the ground. Further steps can always be taken in one sense or another. But I get the sense of the, the profound sense of your, of your question that is also an element of frustration, I believe, not only for me, but uh, for, for many around the world. What can be effective in stopping this military operation? This is a question, this is the one million dollars question. Uh, what we can try to do is, again, to use all our means to try and put pressure, making clear that this is not a way for us to enter into um, a zone of, uh, um, of conflictuality with Turkey. We also state in the conclusions that we uh, consider Turkey as a partner, as an important partner, but we believe that what it is doing is wrong in this case. Will that be enough uh, to stop uh, the military action? Um, we'll see. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, uh, the Turkish authorities will need to consider uh, the fact that uh, all their interlocutors and friends and allies in the world are asking them to stop. I take a couple of more questions. I'm sorry, we need to move on. A couple of more questions and then we really need to conclude first to Damon and then Kamisa. <coughs> Hello, Damon Wake from AFP. Um, just going back to this, um, the, the, the conclusions on Syria and the, the sort of arms embargo in inverted commas. Now, I just want to be absolutely clear on, on the effect of what has been agreed today because you said earlier that the formula allows every country, every member state, to abide by the common EU position. And then you said this has the same effect as an arms embargo. But obviously an arms embargo would oblige countries to halt their arms exports. So does today's conclusion, does it oblige member states to stop their arms export or is it, does it only enable them and are they free to, to continue if they see fit? Member states are always allowed uh, to comply with common positions of the European Union. What they've done today is they have committed to do it. And this is uh, a council conclusion. So uh, it's a formal European Union document. They have all subscribed to, they're all shaped. Uh, it's their own wording and that we have, uh, uh, we have shaped together uh, with long discussions and preparation and a lot of uh, also uh, legal uh, um, uh, work behind that. Uh, this is not just allowing them to do it. They have committed to do it today, each and every one of the 28, under a common position of the European Union. So the effect is the same. Are they, are they obliged to do it, though? Are they obliged? The, the, they have commit, no the commitment is there as well as whenever we have uh, a formal, uh, uh, for instance, restrictive uh, measure uh, framework, member states uh, are committed to implement it, then it's their national legal responsibility to do it. The framework is exactly the same. We have a common framework that is a common position of the European Union and the commitment of member states to um, to abide, to, to implement this common position on a national level. Some of them even have more advanced national legislation. Some others will need to work on it. And the important thing to me uh, is that uh, we will uh, uh, gather the relevant council working group uh, already, I don't know if I can say this uh, uh, publicly, but in the next couple of days, let's say so, uh, to uh, have a common monitoring of where different member states stand in this commitment and in implementation of this commitment that they've taken today. Euh, oui, une petite question sur les forages. Je voulais savoir si vous allez proposer un cadre vide ou s'il y a déjà des noms de personnes ou d'entreprises qui participent au forage qui vont être listés. Et si c'est si juste un cadre vide, que faut-il pour qu'il y ait des noms Est-ce qu'on attend des étapes supplémentaires de la part de la Turquie pour que des noms soient inscrits Merci. Euh, je vais répondre en anglais parce que le langage technique en français m'échappe. 
Euh, je, vais, je vais étudier pour ça, mais en um, anglais, on uh, on the drillings, uh, what, uh, what to recall a bit the history of that. Um, in July, in June, uh, and in May, in June, we already addressed the situation. Uh, in the beginning of July, uh, well, in the European Council, in the end of June, beginning of July, I was uh, asked, uh, together with the Commission from the European Council, to present options. Uh, on uh, uh, possible, um, uh, on possible uh, restrictive measures, uh, targeted measures. Uh, we presented these options uh, in the beginning of July, on the 9th. On the 15th of July, the Foreign Affairs Council adopted conclusions asking us to continue working on these options. We have done so over the summer, and I want to thank not only our technical teams, but also all the member states, and in particular uh, the authorities of Cyprus, uh, with whom I have constantly been in contact in, this, uh, in these months, uh, to monitor the situation very closely. Uh, and then today, what the ministers, what the Council has done, is uh, uh, the uh, political decision that is taken to establish the framework. Now, what will happen in the coming days will be, as I explained, the uh, necessary legal acts to put this legal framework in place. And then, obviously, uh, as uh, any time that we have a framework for uh, targeted uh, measures or restrictive measures in place, uh, the, um, the, 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 the filling in of the, of the framework, the names of uh, natural and legal persons, um, will have to be based on concrete suggestions that will normally come from member states with solid legal basis. And so the filling in on the framework will depend on what kind of proposals will be done uh, at that stage. But the uh, agreement, the decision to put in place the framework regime of restrictive measures has been taken today. I'm afraid we'll have to conclude at this point, but uh, maybe see you in uh, November. Thank you very much.